Yes. <clears throat> yeah, sure, sure. That would be fine. That would be fine. Uh, good evening and welcome to the October 28th, 2021 uh, meeting of the Indian River County Planning and Zoning. Uh, we'll begin with the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, Uh, thank you. Um, are there any additions or deletions to the agenda? Uh, Mr. Chair, if we could, I'd, I'd like to try to move item 5A up first. So not necessarily an addition or deletion, just a reorder. Yep, no problem. We'll, we'll do that. Is that it? That's it for me. All right. Um, first order of business is the approval of the minutes for the October 14th, 2021 uh, meeting. Mr. Chair, I move to approve. Uh, Beth moves to approve. Uh, second, um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Um, min minutes of October 14th, 2021 are approved. Uh, and as you heard Ryan uh, say, we're going to switch uh, order. We're going to begin with a public hearing. Um, this public hearing was, is consideration of a proposal of land development regulation amendments. Uh, this was originally scheduled to be discussed at 9.20 on uh, September 23rd. At that meeting, it was opened and then uh, continued until tonight, 10.28. So what we would like to do is um, open the public hearing and then continue it until 12.9, uh, 21. So uh, motion to open and then uh, continue. I move to open. Beth moves open. I'll second. Second. Mr. Chair, if I could, could you just sound the audience to see if there is anyone that might be here that would wish to comment tonight that would not be able to make it in, in December? All right. Um, anyone here that wants to comment on this uh, agenda item that can't make it in December? None? Okay, good enough. So we have a motion. Um, uh, to continue to open this meeting and continue it until 12-9. And we have a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, the meeting, uh, the uh, public hearing is uh, continued until uh, December 9th. Uh, so the first uh, item is, uh, the, the next item on the agenda is uh, an item that is not on consent. It is a Harbor Isle and this is a request for a major site plan and preliminary plat approval for a 270 unit residential plat oversight plan to be known as Harbor Isle. American Land Development of Central Florida LLC is the owner. KMA Engineering and Surveying uh, LLC is the agent. Uh, this parcel is located on the east side of US Highway 1 south of State Road 510. The zoning is RM6, residential, multifamily, up to six units per acre. Uh, OCR, that's Office of Commer Office Commercial and Residential. Con 2, Estuarine Wetlands and Conservation District. Land use designation is M1, medium density residential, up to eight units per acre, um, and commercial, industrial, and C2 conservation. Um, declaration of any ex parte communications on this? Uh, none. Uh, anyone who would like to speak on this and, and the following uh, issue, the following Sebastian Landing, please stand and be sworn in. Uh, thank you. Um, Staff presentation, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. For the record, Ryan Sweeney, Chief for Current Development. I'm going to get forewarned that my voice has been going out a little bit today, so I may have to take a few breather breaks here and there. Uh, tonight, we do have a request for Harbor Isle, a major site plan and preliminary plat, plat oversight plan project. Uh, just quick past approvals for this project site. Some folks are probably familiar with the previous Approvals originally in 2005, the Planning and Zoning Commission approved 
uh, a joint project of 497 multifamily units and a range of 90,000 to 130,000 square feet of commercial building area under a project which was Orchid Landing Village. In 2006, the Planning and Zoning Commission, or well, the applicant, broke off the residential portion of the project and the Planning and Zoning Commission approved 499 multifamily units under the project named Bristol Bay. And that project did get started, uh, was, I'm not sure of the exact percentage, but was partly constructed and then ultimately um, construction was abandoned and it has been essentially abandoned since, since that time. Today's request or tonight's request is for 270 single family detached units uh, through a plot oversight plan process. The project site is approximately 100 acres and is located east of US-1, south of, I know it says County Road 510, but it's technically State Road 510 east of US-1, it's FDOT jurisdiction. Uh, and from this point forward, north is now to the right, so just the orientation has changed. Here's an aerial depicting the existing conditions of the site. And it's over, the site plan is overlaid, so it's a little bit hard to make up, but you can see the site plan does follow most of the existing roadway infrastructure, some of the lesser roadways or driveways will be abandoned and reconfigured, but you can see the existing stormwater ponds primarily remain in their current configuration. Yes. No, I'm good. Here is the site plan, again, US-1 to the west, State Road 510 to the north, and showing the 270 single family units with the south phase two, sort of a new layout, but again, the primary north-south roadway and loop roads exist currently. They will have to be uh, refurbished during construction. And there's also a, a active recreation amenity center near the uh, State Road 510 access. The traffic circulation plan includes uh, gated access. Well, let's start with the driveway connections to US-1, a right in, right out uh, driveway connection to US-1 that will be served by a new northbound right turn lane that's a required improvement as well as a driveway connection to State Road 510 with eastbound and westbound left and right turn lanes. Those are also required project improvements. And that will allow for a full movement, dual ingress, dual egress driveway connection to State Road 510. Uh, once you get into the project site, there is what in the staff report is referred to as a perimeter frontage road that will be open to the public. It provides access to the not included but future commercial parcel and the public can access from US-1 through the frontage road to the commercial parcel and to State Road 510 and vice versa. Um, beyond the frontage road will be gated and all private, only to residents. Um, and the, I mentioned the right turn lanes. Yep, so, and again, the primary uh, north-south roadway that exists now uh, re remains in its current configuration. <clears throat> The stormwater plan includes the four existing stormwater ponds, primarily in their same um, layout. There's some minor tweaks, but primarily the, the ponds remain the same as they are currently uh, already been excavated. The landscape plan includes littoral zone and lake shoreline plantings around the existing ponds, uh, landscape area for the recreation center, internal buffers for what we call double frontage areas where a lot fronts on two roads, as well as perimeter buffers uh, there's a formal oak theme required by the Wabasa Corridor and then the US-1 and perimeter buffer requirements. Dedications, improvements, and other conditions. The US-1, there's existing sidewalks on US-1 and State Road 510, but um, they'll need to be refurbished based on the right turn lane on US-1 will uh, be adjusted, and then also State Road 510 will also be brought in quite a ways and, and rebuilt for the turn lanes an internal sidewalk pedestrian system throughout the project, uh, street lighting or site lighting um, throughout the project, the common green space recreation area, I mentioned the active uh, amenity center, also the wetlands portion of the site is considered to be part of the common green space. The, the frontage road, there's currently a public access easement that follows the old alignment that provides a, a easement connection down south to, I believe it's 81st Street, as well as north to State Road 510. <clears throat> Through a separate application process, not part of tonight's application, the applicant is requesting to do away with that south leg. It no longer connects, and that whole south area has been re, uh, readjusted. But the north leg will be essentially abandoned and reestablished or replaced, and it will fit the new alignment. 
and that's through a separate process, but that will need to occur to keep the public access for that frontage road. The also, again, I mentioned the, the required eastbound and westbound turn lanes on State Road 510 and the north uh, right turn, northbound right turn lane on US 1 is a required improvement. And with that, staff's recommendation is that the Planning and Zoning Commission grant major site plan and preliminary plot approval for the Harbor Isle plot over site plan project with conditions listed in staff report. I'll run through them quickly. Final landscape and buffer plan uh, at the staff level for LDP, final street lighting design. Approval of an internal roadway restoration plan, again, for the existing roads that need to be refurbished. Construction of the required internal and external sidewalk improvements. The left turn lane and right turn lane on State Road 510. The right turn lane on US 1. Replacement of the public access easement. And all other on-site improvements per each phase. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ryan. Uh, Commissioner, questions? I have one. Um, is the... The public road, uh, the front frontage road, is that going to be dedicated and will the county be responsible for that or will that remain private? It, it will be, it will, will remain private. It will be the HOA's responsibility, but public will have access to it. So it will, it will not be a county dedicated road. Okay, yeah, thank you. Alan? Um, <clears throat> Ryan, as I understand it, these the single family houses are going to be on the lot and basically covering the entire lot. Correct, give or take. There's a very small amount of private uh, green space, but okay. primarily covered by the unit. My question is um, when single family residences are built in an RM6 zoning district or in an OCR zoning district, are there normally uh, minimum lot size requirements, minimum frontage requirements, setback requirements, side lots, front and rear lots? Not in the plat over site plan process, no. In fact, it's the opposite. It's required to be essentially limited to just the building footprint in a very small area beyond. Okay. So, so normally there would be setbacks and frontage and minimum lot size. Correct. Yeah, and let me correct myself. Uh, um, the... There, there still have to meet the perimeter setbacks, so units would have to meet the setbacks from the project perimeter. They still have to meet the overall open space. They still meet all of those parameters, just not on an individual lot unit basis, if that makes sense. Well, and, and it might. Um, I understand the spaces, for example, between the lots are common property. Right. Um, how the distance between one house and the other house, one residence and the other residence, that spacing, I didn't see any dimensions in here, but how does the spacing proposed here between residences compare to setback requirements that would normally exist in an RM6 and OCR district? Uh, the side setback in the RM6 zoning district for conventional single family subdivision would be a 10 foot side per each lot. So you would have 20 feet of separation. In this scenario, it's actually driven by Florida building code there's a minimum 10 foot wall to wall. So it's effectively a five foot setback to an imaginary line, 10 foot separation between. Okay. And the way you get to those lesser setbacks, for example, is because this is a plat over whatever. Correct. Talk to me about that a little bit. Right. Um, what is that and how does it, what, what's the purpose behind that? So the, the it's, uh, I, again, um, this is something that's become a lot more popular and a lot more common that we've seen in the multifamily residential, there's probably, I'd say a dozen, if not 20 plot over, single family plot over site plan projects in the multifamily. And the way we arrived at it is kind of odd in that this isn't required to be plotted. In theory, they could build 270 detached units as a single rental multifamily project, if you will. The plotting over is purely ownership. They can be sold fee simple. But the, the thought is that multifamily, you could, you could put all these 270 units together and they would be attached multifamily, but you can build detached multifamily, if you want to call it, not platted, have a single ownership and each one would be rented. And that's actually something we're seeing is becoming popular too, folks that don't want home ownership. Mm -hmm. And if I could add a few uh, comments about plat over site plan, there's a lot of advantages to this from a community development standpoint. Um, for one, you, and ensure sort of a uniform maintenance of all the property in the entire neighborhood. 
So the area is owned in common, maintained in common. It's a popular home ownership option, particularly for retirees, don't want to go out there and have to maintain anything. You own basically to your own walls, the rest is owned in common, and it maintains a uniform level of activity here. That's great. It cuts down on code enforcement complaints. It cuts down on somebody who's been out of town for an unanticipated length of time and doesn't maintain their lawn. So the neighbors don't have to look at things like that. And, uh, and from a density standpoint, maybe a little higher density than a conventional neighborhood, but it's sure a heck of a lot less than they can build today, less than half. So it's appealing to us from those standpoints. And uh, I think it fits in better with sort of the, the lifestyle options that an increasing number of Vero Beach residents seek. And it's certainly a lot lower density than, than what is possible. So. The 499 units that were approved, I guess, in 2005 or six and not built, were those on the same piece of land that we're now talking about 270 units? C correct, yes. No, generally exact, that's correct. the case, but is it exactly the same piece of it's, land? It is the exact same piece. It's less out that commercial piece, which is, if you can see mm -hmm. the commercial, the, the commercial's, commercial is less out. Those 499 units are the exact same development site. And they were, they were townhomes, um, so the density was, obviously the unit count and density was slightly higher because they were attached, but they weren't, you know, multi-story. That's how you get really dense really quick. A um, couple of other quick questions. Is there a median break at US-1 at the location of this entranceway? I don't, I don't believe so. Um, I couldn't tell from the photos. Uh, let me. Kind of looked like there might be, but I couldn't tell. Uh, let's see here. I want to say, and yeah, unfortunately with the overlay, the aerial doesn't come out. Ask the engineer. I don't uh, think there is. Yeah. Yeah, I, th yeah. I think it's too close to the intersection of uh, US-1 and 510. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. If, if, yeah, Dave can answer. <laughs> I'm not sure on the top of my head. Looks like it. <clears throat> Good evening. My name is David Knight with KMA Engineering and Surveying. And yes, on US-1, uh, since the original project was developed and the road was stubbed out to that location, US-1 Improvements did construct a left-only U-turn Mm, just um, about 50 feet south or 60 feet south of the proposed entrance. So you'll see on our plan, instead of our main entrance road going out straight as it originally was approved and mostly constructed, we had to jog the entrance road so that we didn't uh, encourage anybody to make a shortcut and, and cut across US-1 okay, and take a left out. So it's a right out, right in only on US-1. That's our project entrance. And I, I am kind of wondering, um, what we're calling the frontage road, public access. Um, is, is this an invitation really for people who don't want to go through the intersection because maybe there's too much traffic? I, I, Headed to the beast, just cut right through there and off we go. I, I thought about that. Um, it, it's, it's, realistically, it's probably not much of a shortcut. You've got to turn right, turn left, go through a two lane road, turn left again. <clears throat> I, potentially, I mean, if there were an accident, Possibly, but I don't think it, it's not a speedway shortcut by any means. Mm -hmm. Especially if, if ultimately you're trying to make a right. I mean, you can make right on red, of course, the intersection. I, I don't foresee it being a huge cut through, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And certainly not the opposite way, um, because you can't go south on US 1. So if you would have to still go through the intersection to go south. Let's not give anybody any ideas, Commissioner. <laughs> <laughs> is the only reason that's public access is because of the currently existing easement which grants public access? And well, it, it's, it's good planning to provide, you know, multiple interconnections, but primarily it's to serve the commercial, which I do, I highly anticipate will probably be coming in fairly soon. So it'll allow folks to get to and from the commercial in multiple access ways. Okay. Is that common ownership? The commercial? No, it, it was sold, it was so, yeah. separated and sold off. I don't have any other questions. I have a question. I want to go back to the uh, median there. Um, and this might be a question for the engineer. Can you make that U-turn, if you're heading south on US-1, can you make that U-turn and still be able to get into the development by making a right, or is it too far south? It's, I can't really tell by the... It's, the, it's, it's, it's too far south. Gotcha. Yeah. It's okay. too far south, and it's, it's, a, it's blocked. I get it. because I'm just thinking how many people will be stopping traffic on US-1 trying to make that turn, but if you can't do it, you can't do it. It, it, the truck can do almost anything. Understood. It, I got it's, you. It's directional. So it's not like an open median cut. It's directional to, to make the left onto, I believe that's actually old 
Dixie, right? The connects there? Um, it, you can get that way, but yeah, it doesn't line up. With right. So it, it, it's not just an open median cut. It, it'd be, you'd hit curb, gotcha. almost guaranteed. Gotcha. It's actually a pretty good plan when you look at it. There's a couple of different options. So if you're going southbound on US-1, you can make a left on 510 and then a simple right in. Sure. That way. That's what I would bite at. Um, but if you know, you got the right in, right out on US-1. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the beauty of making a subgrid and not just forcing all the traffic on the 510 and US-1. Yeah, my, my, my only concern, like I said, was trying to make that U-turn and then trying to get in that right turn lane to then turn into the development. But if, if they just don't line up, that's perfect. Yeah. They probably wanted it to be. No, I'm sure, but, but it didn't work out that way. Anything else? Uh, yeah, one more. It's a general question showing my inexperience here. It, you say two parking spaces per home. Uh, does that include the garage, or is that two in the driveway? It, it, the, generally speaking, most of the, the, the homes include a two-car garage, but also a driveway that could also fit two vehicles. So as we know, most folks fill the garage up with things other than vehicles. So more often than not, the, the vehicles can be in the driveway as well, but they, it is satisfied that way. You know, I just left a development in the shores uh, um, that doesn't have room, have room for one car in the driveway. No, these, would, these would be wide enough to, to in order to serve a two-car garage, or typically your driveway is also two cars wide, unless you really taper it down, but it would be too quick to do, to do that. I see, thank you. And uh, my question is, uh, at 510, uh, no stoplight? Correct, not under this development. If the commercial comes in, that might be a different story. So it, at, at going out of the development at 510, you have the choice of a left turn or a right turn? You there, probably be patient if you're making a left. <laughs> is there a stop sign? Is there a stop? Oh, sign? absolutely. Yeah, it's and and directional arrows. Yeah, yeah. So if you're if if you want to make a left, then you're probably better to go to US Correct. one and yeah. make a right. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Correct. Any other questions? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Correct. All right. At this point, we'll open up the floor for comments from the public. Anyone who would like to comment, please come um, state your name, uh, address. Uh, seeing none, uh, and if there are no additional uh, questions, I'll call for a motion. I did motion. have one additional question. Um, I don't believe it showed any landscaping on the uh, individual homes. The, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. For these plot overs, because the lot is so small, they don't have what we call a two tree requirement, which is uh, on a conventional lot. But I can assure you there's street trees. There's other, there is other landscaping. It, we just didn't highlight it on the landscape plan. There's, there's quite a bit of landscaping internal to the project that would be near the homes. Thank you. Okay, call for motion. I'll make a motion. With, with staff uh, staff recommendations. And I'll second it. Okay, we have um, uh, a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, passes unanimously. All right, the next uh, item on our agenda is a public hearing. Um, this is the Sebastian Landing PD. It is a request for a conceptual plan development plan and special exemption approval for a 72 unit multifamily apartment complex with associated amenities. Uh, Gaddis Properties LLC is the owner. WGI Incorporated is the agent. It's located on the east side of US 1, south of 109th Street. Zoning is RM6, residential multifamily up to six units per acre, and conservation two, Estuarine Wetlands Conservation District. Land use designation is L2, low density, residential two up to six units per acre, and C2, conservation two, up to one unit per 40 acres. Uh, the density is 7.43 units per acre. Uh, any uh, declaration of ex parte communications from uh, commissioners? I did have communications with county staff today uh, on two issues. One was 
how the special exception process uh, fit into this agenda item. And the other was um, densities, approximate densities on River Run and Reflections, the two adjoining projects. Very good. And that, that information will come out later, uh, what you learned. Do we need to declare communications with staff or only with interested parties? It would be only with, uh, with uh, interested parties or site visits or um, something of that nature. One of the um, agents or something like that for the developer, then you would want to declare something like that. Right. Thank you. But we good? We're good. Okay. Um, uh, all participants have been sworn in who would like to speak on this, so staff presentation, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Again, for the record, Ryan Sweeney, Chief of Current Development with the County Community Development Department. Tonight's request is for the Sebastian Landing Plan Development, which is a request for conceptual PD plan and special exception approval. A brief slide on the plan development process. The first step, which is tonight, is the conceptual PD plan and special exception uh, whereby the Planning and Zoning Commission is to make a recommendation to the Board of County Commissioners and to hold a public hearing. And then the Board of County Commissioners ultimately will review through a second public hearing. The second step is the preliminary PD plan plat process that comes back to you all at Planning and Zoning Commission. The third step is the land development permit or land development permit waiver at the staff level. Those are the construction drawings. And then the final step is the PD plan plat again back to the Board of County Commissioners. The project site is located on the east side of US-1, just south of 109th Street. As shown here, it is zoned RM6. I don't show the um, CON2 zoning line because it's based on a wetland line that's really hard to scale in. It's kind of a zigzag, squiggly line. The aerial depicting the existing conditions of the site, it's a vacant, undeveloped site. Um, the river run condominiums to the north, the uh, reflections on the river condominiums to the south. This is an older aerial, the Pleasantville ALF. I believe it's changed names now. There's assisted living on US-1 now and a small uh, single-family subdivision, which whose name escapes me, but it's a small seven-lot subdivision here. The proposed development, again, the total site area is 13.46 acres. The uplands is 9.68 acres. The wetlands is 3.78 acres. The proposed total units is 72 multifamily units at a proposed density of 7.43 units per acre. All of the wetlands will be preserved on site, and even though this is a planned development or a planned development proposal, there are no requests for increases or reductions in perimeter buffers, minimum building setbacks, maximum building coverage, or maximum building height, i.e. design waivers. They're not requesting any design changes. The conceptual PD shows the proposed layout of the project. It's four separate three-story, 18-unit buildings, a total of 72 units, uh, an amenity center, cabana and pool, active recreation area, a passive recreation area, the wetlands area here, as well as a uplands uh, set-aside slash buffer between the wetlands and the development area. The traffic circulation plan proposes a full movement uh, gated connection to US-1, so it will be gated, um, but it does this uh, driveway connection is served by an existing median, existing median cut and southbound left turn lane. Uh, right turns can m go into the site. And based on the median, this style of median opening, um, the project residents ex exiting the site could make a right or left, but that left's probably pretty, pretty tricky. Um, the stormwater plan includes uh, three proposed uh, stormwater pond areas shown here in, with blue dots. The landscape plan, the perimeter landscape plan requires a 25 foot type B buffer with six foot opaque feature between uh, along the north property line as well as the south property line and then a 20 foot wide thoroughfare plan road buffer along US-1. There's also a number of uh, interior landscaping requirements, um, parking area, non-vehicular open space um, and the like. Dedications, improvements and other conditions. Again, the perimeter PD uh, buffers that I just mentioned, an internal sidewalk and pedestrian system. There's an existing external uh, US-1 sidewalk already. Site lighting throughout the site and the common green space recreation area, which I already touched based on a little bit. So 
other than this one item, the transfer of density that makes it a planned development, other, this would normally just be a conventional multifamily project that's allowed in the RM6 and would be allowed at 58 units total. And uh, we would still have to come to you all for a, just because it exceeds 25 units, but otherwise it would be a pretty, pretty straightforward uh, item. Through the plan development uh, process and through some uh, policies in our comprehensive plan, the applicant is seeking, and our comp plan actually encourages uh, a transfer of density from environmentally sensitive areas, in this case, wetlands. There's, again, approximately 3.78 acres of wetlands on site. At one unit per acre, they're transferring, transferring from their own site three units. They're also requesting to transfer 11 units from an off site wetland at one unit per acre. And those off site wetlands credits are coming from the CGW Wetlands Mitigation Bank which is an existing 120-acre uh, site, an existing mitigation bank uh, in central Indian River County. It's just south of Grand Harbor, north of the uh, State Ridge 60 Bridge on the, on the riverfront. And um, through this exercise, it does require deed restrictions and or easements subject to the county attorney's liking for to, to restrict the development uh, on those wetlands so nobody can do a double switch later and come back and develop those wetlands later. A little bit more on the transfer of density. There's also limitations on the, the amount of, of density you can transfer from off-site wetlands as well as on-site. And it gets a little bit confusing, but I'll try to speak in plain terms as possible. The upland zoning, or the upland area, which is zone arm six, is allowed a total of 58 units by right. So you can only transfer up to 20% of that 58 from off-site. The number is, I believe it's 11.6, so you round down, you get 11 units. That's a maximum that you're allowed to transfer from off-site. For on-site, you could, in theory, transfer 39, or I'm sorry, 29 uh, units, but you would have to have 29 acres of on-site wetlands in order to do that. They only have 3.8, so they're transferring the three. If they had considerable more wetlands, they, they could transfer it to on-site, but up to 50%. So that's how they yield the 14 total additional units. Uh, this is explained and outlined in our comprehensive plan. It's actually, it, it, the county shall encourage uh, the density transfer as an incentive to protect and preserve uh, wetlands, both on-site and off-site. Uh, and it's also further defined and a, bit, a, a little bit more defined in the county plan development section, 915.08, um, that, that it, it primarily it tells you how to do the calculation to get to the density yield. And uh, again, this is really the only thing they're seeking, and it, it says very clearly that it can only be done through a plan development because of the density and the documents that go with it. It has to be controlled, um, so it's done through a PD. But other than that, they're not seeking. In fact, because they're doing a PD, they actually have to do some increased buffering. So it's, it's uh, not necessarily a trade-off per se, but just by going through the plan development process, additional requirements are, are, are kicked in. And staff's recommendation is that the Planning and Zoning Commission recommend that the Board of County Commissioners grant conceptual PD plan and special exception approval for Sebastian Landing PD with conditions listed in staff's report, the deed restrictions and or easements over the wetland areas, the final street lighting design, final landscape buffer and tree mitigation plans, and then conservation easements over the wetlands and uplands on site through the plat. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, planning and zoning commissioner questions, please. I have another new guy question. Um, this is either six units per acre or one unit per acre, and I guess it's, uh, but it comes out at 7.43 units per acre. That's because of the transfers? Correct. Okay. Correct. Thank you. The additional, essentially the, the difference in the six and the 7.43, the 1.43 additional units per acre is the transfer. But usually you're not able to... Typically you're not allowed to exceed the underlying or zoning or land use, but it's essentially except for this process only that you can exceed it. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's one other... Wow. One other mechanism, <laughs> as the heavens open, uh, for affordable housing is the only other option where you can exceed your density. <clears throat> yep, go ahead, Alan. <laughs> I 
before the power goes out. <laughs> I know. Uh, following up on the question that was just asked, um, the zoning classification RM6, six units per acre, and the land use designation, uh, six units per acre. And the only way we're getting from six to 7.43, which is roughly a 25% increase in density, is really by traveling through the, the uh, plan development process. Okay. And we've traveled down that path before, either when a plan development as a project, which brings you down one path, or as a rezoning, which brings you down another path. My first question is, when we faced some of these plan development um, proposals in the past, and I can't really recall if it was a project or a um, rezoning, but we've always had the question in front of us of public benefit. What is the public benefit of, of really moving away from the zoning requirements and allowing some significant break from the zoning requirement, or significant advantage? Now, number one, is that required in this case? Num and number two, whether required or not, are there any public benefits in moving from a six unit per acre zoning and land use classifications over to the 25% increase to 7.43. Sure, thank you. Uh, the, the typically public benefit is to offset or counteract the waivers or reductions that they're seeking in design criteria. Um, and that can be done through compatibility measures like increased buffers, widths, types, what have you. Um, impacts on surrounding roadways, you know, that can trigger offsite roadway requirements. The public benefit in this is inherent to what they're doing, which is uh, per uh, permanently uh, preserving and maintaining both on-site and off-site wetlands. And let me play devil's, devil's advocate for just a second. Technically, they could get a permit, conceivably, get a permit to fill a portion, probably not all, but a portion of the wetlands, let's say two acres, for example, of the 3.8. Well, they, they could actually get 12 <laughs> units right there by filling, they would have to pur purchase mitigation credits, which ironically, instead of purchasing mitigation credits, they're getting transfer of density. But the yield would be that they would still get the units that they're seeking. They would f impact and fill two units, or two acres of wetlands, develop on those wetlands, be that much closer to the river, and we would be essentially for the worse off. So the public benefit is to promote and incentivize um, protecting and, and, and preserving wetlands. The other thing is, they're not getting a lot of density. They're getting one unit per acre. Um, whereas if they were to fill, they get six units per acre. And, or in the M2, they could get eight or 10 units per acre if they were to fill wetlands. For my own education, we, we've talked so much about public benefit in the past with, with planned developments. Is it required in both or only in rezoning? Or It's, it's required for both, but it's commensurate with what they're requesting. Right. And again, they're not requesting any other, any other reductions, increases, waivers, what have you. They're not changing anything they would be required to do other than the density. The sole requirement that they're requesting is the change in density, and therefore they have to go through the PD. and staff thought it appropriate that <clears throat> the protection and preserving of the 3.8 acres of on-site and the, the off-site stuff's already effectively protected. It's owned by the land trust, it's, it's covered through a mitigation bank process, but it will be permanently even more so protected. But the on-site especially um, is, is preserved. And there's 3.8 acres less of wetland, estuarine wetlands along the river that could be developed. Okay. Um, the one piece that I thought was missing from this memo um, is that the only way we can get from where we are to where they want to be is by going through that special exception use analysis, as I understand correctly. Um, and that's an analysis set forth in section 971.05, which starts off by saying the, the proposed uses that go through special exception use are typically uses which are not appropriate in a certain district, but will be allowed if and there are, there's a whole set of requirements 
dealing with compatibility of the neighborhoods, impact on the neighborhoods. Um, the burden, according to 97105, is on the applicant to prove by whatever it was, competent substantial evidence, that those requirements are met. Or stated differently, the prohibitions are not in play of, of uh, 97105. And I'd like to focus on that a little bit, this whole question of impact on surrounding properties, which I understand is in play under 97105, compatibility with surrounding properties, which is why I'd raise that question of what's the density of uh, river run and reflections. But if you could comment on that, please. Yeah, I, I will, and I'll, I see Bill is thumbing through pages, so I might also uh, ask him to weigh in. Um, the. The special exception crosswalk with a PD and the 971 is not 100% clear because there's other there's plenty of other uses or projects that are special exception uses that are not PDs and they follow through the 971 criteria. Those are typically the most obnoxious noxious uses um, that also have to meet the specific land use criteria outlined in 971. I, I it's not a perfect system, but I think the PD is set up in either a rezoning, which I explained to you was if the actual use that they're seeking is not allowed in the zoning district, then they have to rezone to a custom PD zoning district. But probably 80% of the PDs we've done over the past 30 years are PD special exceptions. A good example of that is just your single family RS3, single family homes are allowed, but they're seeking waivers, reductions in setbacks, lot sizes, building coverage on the lot but not on the total. This one's a little bit weird. It doesn't require a PD rezoning because, again, multifamily development's allowed in the underlying zoning, but it has to go through a process, the special exception process, which requires public hearings and is subject to the compatibility, the four criteria that are mentioned in 971. But I wouldn't go beyond 97105. You don't go any further into 971. You go to 915, which is the, the PD, the plan development regulations. And it, and it expressly states in PDs that in order to seek a density, transfer a density or a density bonus, it must be as a PD. There's no other option. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and I'd look to Bill on this as well. Is the, the applicant in, on this agenda item required to prove by substantial competent evidence, again, whatever that phrase was in, in that uh, ordinance, that they do not negatively impact uh, the, the, you know, and you can look at the different things here, the, the safety, comfort, good order, welfare of the surrounding properties. Uh, do they have that burden in this hearing? I wouldn't use the word prove. I think maybe the word show or demonstrate would be a little bit uh, more accurate. Um, when you start to prove something, you're, uh, I, I, I think, you know, the evidence will, will show that they meet that standard. If you want to use the word prove, I suppose, but yes, they would have to make a showing um, that the preponderance of the evidence offered would meet the showing. And, and the only, the reason why I'm using those words, and again, I'm, I'm struggling with the application of 97105 to this agenda item, you know, how exactly it, it applies. But 97105 does say the applicant shall have the burden of establishing by competent material and substantial evidence the existence of the facts and conditions essentially required by this section, which is where I'm coming up with that language. I see. Um, and I, I guess I'm asking the question to both of you, does that apply here? Does the applicant have to show us these things? Let, let me perhaps answer by, by answering a couple other questions. Um, that you didn't ask, <laughs> uh, if that's fair. Uh, first of all, that, that didn't ask all sorts of right, questions. Right. The, the applicant is here, and, and and they do have a presentation, and they have a fully capable team to answer plenty of questions. Um, in terms of com compatibility, since you mentioned it, and I, I I didn't mention it during the presentation, but these are ballpark. The, the condos are hard, kind of hard to deal with. They they don't have individual lots, so you can't just count lots. The parcels are kind of funky because there's a lot of common, common ownership. But from what I could best venture a guess, and this is probably margin of error, about half a unit per acre, it looks like reflections on the river is at 7.5 units per acre. So maybe it's 7, maybe it's 8, but probably 7.5. Best I could tell from River Run is at about 8.5 units 
per acre. So the densities for those two condominium associations are right in line, if not slightly higher than what they're requesting. So from a straight a compatibility density measure, I, I definitely you'd be hard pressed to say they're not compatible. The other thing is in 915 under what's called compatibility requirements is those buffering requirements. Um, and those apply to PDs, they are, they are higher and more, uh, you know, more stringent buffering requirements than would otherwise be required if this were just a 58 unit multifamily subdivision. The third thing I'll mention is that if they were just doing a straight 58 unit multifamily development, the setbacks would actually decrease and um, the, they could potentially be much closer to the single family homes, uh, only 15 feet and three stories it, they would be shadowing the homes. Um, they've done a pretty good job of keeping the, the buildings away from the homes. They have a relatively large stormwater pond in between them. And, and also, again, hundreds of feet away from the river. The, the last thing I'll say is that they don't have a choice. In order to do it, they have to go through 915. And the, the measurable criteria are the 20% the and the 50% and the, the, the calculations that are laid out. I have the comp plan policy here, um, but again, I didn't pull the code section. It's just effectively the same thing, but the, those are the measurable criteria that we have to go by. And just to follow up on that, Ryan, I mean, from the code, the applicant shall have the responsibility to present evidence in the form of testimony, exhibits, documents, models, plans, and the like to support the application for approval of the special exception use. So I, 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 I guess we'll, I, I, we'll, we'll, we'll see what their presentation is. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, any other commissioner questions at this time? One more quick thing. Um, you mentioned, uh, well, not in the presentation, but in the, in the backup material, you mentioned the possibility of a future peer. Would that come back here, or is that uh, handled administratively? Th that would be at the staff level, and it, it would be, well, unless it triggered, if they were trying to do something like a marina, that trigger. I'm not, I'm not the river oceanfront guy, but more likely than not, it would not require planning and zoning commission approval. It will require Army Corps DEP permits, and it'll be pretty stringently, you know, regulated to that end. Well, there may be a roadway, I imagine, and some parking. Or oh, no, no, no. This would just, in fact, you can kind of see. Be a walking path. Yeah, it would be, I think, I think they're like a 10-foot max with a 5-foot, like very, very minimal. Yeah, pier itself, 4 feet. I see. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, this is a public hearing, and so I will open the public hearing. Um, and uh, should we start with the... Uh, developer's presentation? Yes, sir. All right, let's start with that. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, commissioners, Mr. County Attorney. I'm Joseph Paladin. I'm the president of Black Swan Consulting and Entitlement. Um, been here for several years. Most of you already know me. I'll be the owner's rep on this project, not only tonight for the P&Z meeting, but throughout the project. And uh, I'll leave my uh, private phone number if anybody is interested. And so if they have any questions throughout the project, they can call me night or day. I've had the same phone number for 30 years. Uh, anyway, um, I have my staff here with me tonight. Uh, I have Matt Barnes with WGI. He's our planner. I got Craig Jones, who's the, president, who's the principal of NGCGW, the mitigation bank. Uh, and I got the... Uh, um, I got Mr. Otega here, who's our traffic engineer, and I got Mr. David Austin here, who's the owner. So any questions that I can't answer, uh, which I'm sure I can answer most of them, I'll rely on my staff that's here tonight. Um, but I will be a part of this project, throughout the project. I'll be the face of the project. Any problems that you have, you can contact me anytime, 24-7, and I'll respond immediately. So if there's any questions I can answer, I'll be happy to answer them. If not, then I'll have my team here answer the questions. Any questions? I mean, this is a perfect, like say one other thing. This is a perfect example of a 
private-public partnership. Perfect example. The county uh, with the WCG with the, doing a partnership together without the county working with us, without them working with us, we can never do this project. We can never preserve a mile of, uh, of uh, waterfront. We can never preserve the uh, wetlands and et cetera like we did without the total cooperation of the county, the staff, uh, the engineers, everybody involved. So this is a perfect example of everybody working together, getting something good. And actually, you know, for the area itself, I mean, there's really no place here in the area for people to live or stay. I mean, there's no rental units. There's no units that people can find to even they, they can afford to buy. So I think this serves a need and a purpose, and uh, it's going to be uh, our rates will be at the market rate. So it'll, it'll be very accessible and you know, fill a need for the county. Anything that you all have questions on? Any questions? Joe, I don't know if this is a <clears throat> question for you as staff, but river run and reflections are what? Condominiums and single family homes? It, yeah, it's a, yes. A yeah. Condominium, single family villas, the, the ownership does vary. Okay, but it's not rental apartments in either of those. Two. Not not direct rental. There's probably sub sub renting, but yes, it's not a rental market rate no. product. Okay. Yeah, and then Pleasantville is the assisted living facility, which I did, and that was part of Reflections at one time. Okay. Uh, Pleasantville, Pleasantville was the part of Reflections at one time, and I was yeah. part of that uh, assisted living facility that's built there. Okay, thank you. Thank Dr. You. Day, I, think, I believe that Matt Barnes is going to make this presentation here. Okay. Uh, good evening, Commissioners. Uh, Matthew Barnes with WGI um, here on behalf of the property owner. Uh, do I advance this? Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, if you actually here, I, you can just ask me to do it, but if you, okay. you want to just click through, sure, it sure. should work. So, right, let me. Yeah. Your professional staff did a great job explaining the, the the nuts and bolts of the application i'll just run through a, a few things that to answer some of your questions commissioner uh, uh that you asked earlier about the special exception as well you know where the site is it's you know, we've gone over that um this is a this is a, a colored rendered view of the site plan ryan ran through the, the elements of the site plan as well so i'll go through it briefly there is the nature trail that you can see that does connect the, the, the development to the river, but through the preserved 3.78 acres of wetlands. Um, as Ryan mentioned, um, there's two different recreation areas, a, an active recreation area near the front, near US-1, with a pool and a cabana, and a passive recreation area that just has a walking trail, which is next to the upland preserve area. And there is gated access off of US-1. Um, what just came up on the screen is an orange box. That's the 0.45 acres of the upland preserve area. And he, highlighted there is the almost four acres of on-site wetlands that are being preserved. As Ryan also mentioned, there's, there's a 25-foot wide landscape buffer around the entirety of the property, uh, north and south and also west to US-1. And of course, the wetlands are, in essence, one giant buffer. Um, and I'll give you a, this is a, here's a, you know, a representative cross section of that buffer. So important thing to understand is there's a five point, there's a five foot three inch uh, berm in the middle of the buffer to begin with. And there's a six foot fence on top of the, the berm. So you're at 11 foot three inches right there with a hedge on both sides of the fence and varied plantings, uh, you know, in heights on both sides of the fence, on the front side and on the back side. Again, this is a representative cross-section. The, the buffer is not uniform in its design as it's not supposed to be. It's supposed to represent varied interest. And, and, and this next view here is a view looking you know, down, straight down on it. You can see in this view how there is a difference in the buffer from as you move along it. There's uh, clustered palms in some areas. There's uh, silver buttonwoods on the back side. Um, there's uh, orange Geiger trees that are sprinkled throughout, too. Um, and setbacks, uh, setbacks were mentioned earlier. This will run through exactly what we have. So from the front, 
only 30 feet is required by code. We're over 200 feet to the nearest building. Um, on the north side, um, as Ryan mentioned, if this was not a PD, we could have a 15-foot setback. Um, we're at 33 feet to the north property line, but we're actually 238 feet, you know, structure to structure, uh, to the nearest to the north. On on this sort of rear slash rear slash side uh, property line, it's 172 foot setback to the property line and a 230 feet to to that particular home. From this corner here, it's 45 feet is provided, 15 required, about 76 to that house, and then 244 to that particular house. And then finally on the south, 30 feet is provided, and about 85 to the nearest structure to the south. Um, TDRs, it, your staff did a great job of explaining, you know, what the TDRs, uh, how we're utilizing the TDR program. Uh, we're using both on-site and off-site, um, three units from on-site, 11 from off-site. And this is sort of a, a similar breakdown to what, what Ryan went through. So it's, you know, 13.46 in total. The uplands part is, gets us 58 units per the six units per acre uh, as of right. The wetlands, it's one unit an acre rounded down. So we get three units from that. Subtotal is 61. And then, as Ryan explained, it's 20% of your maximum density allowed on the uplands. So that's 58 units times 20%. That's your 11 units that we're transferring from the CGW bank offsite. So 61 plus 11 is your 72 that we have proposed. Um, you know, it, it, this, it, it, it complies with your comprehensive plan. It, it actually implements your comprehensive plan and your land development regulations. This is exactly what your code calls for and encourages. Um, what you see on the screen is a citation directly from section 92809 of your land development regulations. It says, as an incentive to direct development activities away from wetlands and deep water habitats, it shall be allowable through the PD process to apply for a density credit transfer from wetlands and deep water habitats to project uplands. It's exactly what this project is proposing to do. Uh, wetlands or deep water habitats utilized for density transfer credit shall be preserved via the establishment of a conservation easement, which is something that when the time comes, we will, of course, provide the easement. Uh, the comprehensive plan goes on to state, the county shall continue to provide for the transfer of development rights from wetlands to approved uplands. Again, that's exactly what we're here uh, trying to accomplish with this, with this project. And nothing can happen on the project site until the developer does provide the appropriate deed restrictions that are recorded on both the on-site wetlands and the off-site wetlands. Uh, briefly, because uh, Craig is here, I'll just, uh, and I think he's gonna speak to the particulars of, of the bank. But, uh, you know, Craig and the, and the CGW mitigation <coughs> have collaborated and worked together with the county to preserve and prevent any future development to, it's actually um, just a little over 150 acres of land uh, along the uh, Indian River Lagoon Basin within their bank. And here's a location map of, of where that property is. Um, you know, preventing and development and preserving the CGW property along the nearly one mile of waterfront was a very high priority for the county and for CGW. So. In order to help accomplish this, uh, the county awarded TDRs to CGW so that no development would ever happen on the CGW property and that those residential development rights could be transferred to other areas in Indian River County, such as the project that we're bringing forward to you. Subsequently to that, uh, Craig has donated the entire 151 acres of the property to the Indian River Land Trust and has worked with the Land Trust to raise over $267,000 that's placed in a trust for the perpetual environmental maintenance of the property for future Indian River County residents to enjoy and benefit. And I think, as Ryan pointed out, that's in and of itself a public benefit um, inherent to the, to the process and the project. Um, other public benefits, um, you know, we're preserving almost four acres of on-site wetlands. As, as Ryan pointed out, we, there was an opportunity, or just that there was a, a path forward that we could have sought to 
you know, impact some of the on-site wetlands to achieve the same unit count, that wouldn't, that would have been a, a loss for the county, a loss for the environment. <coughs> Um, we're not doing that. We're going through the established procedures in your comprehensive plan and your land development regulations. Uh, and then, of course, through the TDR program, we're preserving in perpetuity a portion of what's been set aside in the CGW bank. We're also preserving almost half an acre of on-site um, uplands. Um, there's, you know, one and a third acres of recreation areas on the site that lessens the load of um, the residents of this project on the public recreation facilities. Uh, as I've gone through, there's large landscape buffers and large setbacks, larger than what was required if we didn't come in as a uh, planned development. And there's significantly more open space. Um, we're providing 68% of the site as open space compared to 51%, which is required. That's a 33% increase in the amount of open space that we're providing on, on the property. Um, you know, we're consistent with the comprehensive plan. Your, your professional staff has evaluated the, the project and has determined this. We're consistent with the plan development standards. Again, your professional staff has evaluated the project and determined that that's the case. We're also compatible with the adjacent existing uses. This compatibility is one of the four things that is in that special exception criteria, if you will. So, you know, we're similar in, in size and scale and density to other multifamily developments that front on US-1. As you heard, the guesstimated, approximated densities of the properties to our north and south, 7.5 units an acre, 8.5 units an acre. They didn't use TDRs. We're using TDRs. We're preserving on-site and off-site wetlands. 25 per foot perimeter buffers are being provided around the entire property, not just part of it, all of it. We also have very significant setbacks to the abutting single family homes and also the multifamily homes on either side of us. 33 feet to the north, uh, where 15 is required, you know, 45 feet and 172 feet, where 15 feet is required, 30 and 15. And then, of course, as I just reiterated, that. Um, a lot more open space, 33% more than what is required is being provided. And we're not requesting any waivers or variances from your land development regulations. So as you just heard, you know, your, your professional staff has evaluated the land development regulations and the comprehensive plan and the project and is recommending approval. So just to wrap up what we've gone through, we're consistent with all of the standards, <coughs> buffers, landscaping, parking, no waivers being requested, no variances. It's an appropriate low-medium density multifamily infill project that's adjacent to other low-medium multifamily developments. Significant setbacks and perimeter landscape buffers are being provided. We're preserving on-site and off-site wetlands and upland preserve areas. Two recreation areas are being provided, active and passive. And finally, again, more open space, you know, we're not meeting the minimum, we're, we're going above and beyond the minimum. So that concludes our presentation. Um, here to answer any questions. Uh, I'd like to reserve time for rebuttal as well, in case that's necessary. Staff questions for Mr. Barnes? I'd just ask you to repeat something because I didn't hear it very well. What did you say with the densities on the north and south developments, river run and reflections? And, and I was just repeating what I heard from, from Ryan. I think it was 7.5 to the north, approximately, and 8.5 to the south. It's opposite. opposite. Seven, oh, sorry. seven and a half to the south, eight and a half to the north. Again, approximate, but probably within a half unit margin of error. Thank you. Um, hold on. Uh, I've got one question. Um, could you go back to your very first slide, or, or it's the slide that's up without the thank you on it? Oh, I can do it. I can yeah, probably do it quicker. Oh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I've got all the animation here. Uh, almost there. Uh, this one? Yeah, and that, that, this question, I think, is for Ryan. What was the land use designation immediately to the north of the um, proposed marsh? 
it, essentially everything east of US-1 is L2. It's all L2. So the zonings vary, but the, the, land, the underlying land use is L2, which allows uh, RS6, RM6. And, and the, the marsh in the proposed development is L2? No, that, that is C2 slash CON2. The reason that we don't actually show it is because, again, it's based on the, it's effectively, if I could, I'm stealing from your presentation now, that uh, if you can see my cursor, the wetland line is, is, uh, is the zoning line, if that makes sense. We, we don't draw it in on the zoning maps because it's unique and specific to each parcel as determined by a certified uh, wetland, del ah, wetland delineation survey. Sorry. So that wetland ended right there. It didn't extend to the north. Oh, uh, you mean when the subdivision? It yeah. probably more than likely did. It was probably filled and developed. That, I'm sure that single-family subdivision is, is much older. So I, I'm sure it probably did exist at some point. If if you look to the south, I don't know if you have a good aerial to the south. The, the um, reflections on the river here. Here, actually, let me do this. Let's see if mine. Um, mm, yeah, yeah. So you can kind of see uh, the wetland area that does exist to the east of um, reflections on the river. Yeah. Generally, it's a few hundred feet along the coast if it hasn't been impacted and developed. So filling and developing is an option. It correct. It okay. is good. And let me add a little one more comment on, on the uh, on-site density transfer. Uh, we had an almost identical property and it annexed into the city with the identical density development. And I reached out, I was kind of curious about it. And like, well, we could have allowed almost the same project here. Why'd, why'd you go to the city? And they have a different formula for calculating what their on-site transfer would be. And the new guy could maybe collaborate this. And they said, um, yeah, we allow, basically, we, we have let you yield about one per one acre. So there's a three unit transfer from that um, on-site estuarine wetland onto the uplands and they would have allowed whatever the underlying density would have been. So it was a multiple. So it was a, it was a good 10 units they get, would have gotten extra under the city's code. So what I learned from that, I think the county takes a fairly conservative approach to that. So 3.78 acre site that yielded three units. All right, um, thank you, Mr. Barnes. Um, would you like to speak or ask a question? Come up to the podium, state your name. I believe you're Mr. Darrell. My name is Joseph Ron. I'm from Indian River, uh, River Run, Sebastian. Yeah. So are you going to make a statement as well? No, I just want to ask him a question okay. on the, yep. the slides. And then go ahead. the last slide. <laughs> uh, let me do it this way then. If I, uh, not the, the thank you? <laughs> or the one no, no, before no. thank you? Keep going. Uh, let's see. There's a comment on it. It says low, medium, multifamily. Uh, lo, low, medium. And I want to know what that means, what the definition of that is. Um, I, let's see. Where, where was that? Last, last slide. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. You're right. Yeah. On that one, here, please. Yep. There you go. I'll, I'll low, low, medium density, multifamily. Uh, sorry. Give me <laughs> one second. Well, oh, of course it didn't. Oh, it's, it's an error. There, second bullet. Yeah, yeah. Infill projects adjacent to other low, medium, multifamily developments. What does the low, medium mean in that in those developments? You referring to reflections and uh, river run? I'll, that's an applicant's coin <laughs> or to fra coin phrase. <laughs> right. I mean, the, yes, low medium means the same as the others to the north and south of us. We're actually slightly. What does the term low medium mean? We're at RM6. I just used it colloquially, and that's not a, I'm not using it as a defined term. I mean, it's, 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 okay. Yeah. Because you're at seven and change. I just yeah. don't understand what it said. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, so seven and change, what's to the north? 8.5. 8, 8, 8. 8.5 to the north, and what's to the south? 7, 7.5. 7? 7.5. 7.5. Okay. Uh, if you have, uh, would like to make a statement, please uh, state your name and your address. Uh, one other thing, I'd like to have Greg Schoen. Uh, come up and do part of his presentation because they had a big thing to do. It's a big part of this public partnership of preserving the uh, riverfront and what have you. Craig, can you get up? Yeah. 
I'll be brief. Uh, the county staff did an outstanding job presenting relative to the CGW mitigation banks, the uh, county rules, and the whole concept of transfer development rights. I just wanted to go back in, in history and just make sure you all understood that uh, there were private investors involved. We collaborated in, in partnership with the county. This was one of the areas, uh, CGW Mitigation Bank, that was one of the highest threats of uh, being impacted by development. So we joined forces and, and stopped it. There's 151 acres of, of property there, just south of the Grand Harbor subdivision, and there's a mile of waterfront along the Indian River Lagoon Basin. So once we accomplished that, the county awarded to help the project with the awarding of the transfer development rights. Had they not done that, the project would have never worked. So again, thanks to the county, the county commission for doing that. Uh, it was a great uh, public-private sector partnership. Relative to the uh, project, um, the county staff and my <coughs> colleagues did a great job of uh, describing uh, the impacts. Um, when I looked at the environmental impacts of the uh, project, they really uh, maximize preservation of, of the environmental footprint on, on the property. Uh, they could have gone a different route. They could have purchased our saltwater credits and filled the wetlands. They decided not to do that. So it maximizes preservation of the um, uh, on-site wetlands and use of the off-site wetlands from the CW Mitigation Bank. Uh, again, it's, it's very tempered. Uh, that kind of fulfills the promise and the partnership that CGW as well as the county had. So I would recommend approval of the project. Thank you. Thank you. You'd like to speak, come forward, please. Is it, uh, to, Mr. Chairman, are, 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 is the applicant finished with their presentation and everything like that? Are there any more questions from the commission members of the applicant? Okay, go ahead. Hi, my name is Jeb Patillo, and I live on 109th Street. I'm in that small subdivision just north of the project. I noticed the references always seems to be Miros and River Run. I'm on the north end. That's a private road there. And I'd like to, a little bit of clarification on setbacks, where the buffer's going to be. I noticed the arrows on the chart are showing the north property line as River Run. Well, that's, that's not true. Okay, Ryan, can you bring up that slide or? or I'm gonna Barnes? go to staff's slides because it's okay. uh, more familiar. Um, so I, I think it's a fairly simple answer. The, 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 the buffer starts at the existing property line and goes into the project, so. South of 109th Street. Correct, the right of way line, correct. And same thing for the, uh, what we'll call the northeast corner. Yeah, that's where my house is, and I'm kind of concerned about the, the measurements on the setback to my house. Correct. Because I'm going to have two, three-story buildings like this. Right. Right next to my house. It, it, understood. Can you point to where his house is? I, I, I believe, are you yes, this? Right yeah, so right the there. you see the dash, oh, in fact, I, the aerial might. Yeah, you that's you. Yes. Ryan, if I remember correctly on the applicant's presentation, there, there were very specific foot, uh, linear feet uh, markers on the distance from your house mm -hmm. to, to the building right there. And that's at its closest point. I mean, um, 76 feet. Mm -hmm. Correct. It is the end of the building. It's not the broadside. Uh, to, to that end, it's... Um, there's, it's going to put shade on the side of my house, actually on the front of my house. My house faces west, the front of my house. Right. Yeah. Oh, did it go? Why did it go away? <laughs> um, oh, you have to do the animations. Okay. So it's not going to shade your house the entire day. Right. It, so when is it going to shade your house based on where where your house is located relative to that when? About 4 o'clock. Uh, what time? Depends on the time of the year. Yeah, yeah in the right winter time. In the winter time in the afternoon, you're definitely going to get some shade there. But you know, it's, it's, I, I think the argument would be if 
only 15 feet's required. Um, and they're 76 feet off. And my other concern is I have to make a U-turn on US-1 if I'm coming from the north to make an entrance into my street. And I'm going to have to make a U-turn right at the entrance where everybody else is turning in. There's no traffic light. And I, what was the, the traffic engineering talking about the last time we were here? I think there was going to be a projected 400 people coming in and out of there per day. And I'm going to have to make a U-turn on US-1. So uh, one thing, this graphic shows there's an existing U-turn gore area where... Right, right at the right. proposed entrance. And, and you can see, it's, and that will remain. Um, yeah, so you, I'm going to have to wait. I'm dealing with the traffic light that's at Mirrors to the south. Mm -hmm. And I'm also dealing with the entrance, cars coming in and out of there with no traffic light. Right. Uh, so the, the total what it's called the ADT, the average daily trips total for the project is below the 400 trip threshold. It's 392 total. The AM, the AM peak hour is um, 26. 26. The PM peak is 32. So in an, in an hour span, we're looking at 32 trips spread. That's one car per two minutes. Um, so that it's pretty, it's pretty hard to make the U-turn right now. I can tell you that. And that's a right. fact. Right, but uh, ask, ask them. And, and, you know, they don't have to make a UE. They're on River Run. Yes, understood. Thank you. Anyone else? You know the, you know the routine. <laughs> yes, I've been here before. John Ferraro, I live at Reflections on the River. And I guess my, my question is, why? You know, why are we here except for the <laughs> fact that they did submit a proposal to change things, but why are we looking to change things? You know, we know why they want to change them, because it's financially advisable. Why do you want to consider changing? How is it going to affect the people who are living there now, just like that gentleman spoke? They have a right to use the land according to the law of the county. Let's let them do what they're allowed to do. Why do we need to change things? Again, I'm trying to figure out why. You know, why would you vote for this? Anybody have a comment? Mr. Ferraro, I'll tell you this, that if they could do what they want to do, it would be a whole lot worse than what we're talking about right now. Why aren't they doing it? There's got to be a financial reason that they're not doing it. I don't agree with that at all. I think that I think that this proposal is an excellent use of this land. Okay, so you're in favor of their plan. Correct. Just like everyone else is here. We'll see. All right, thank you. My name is Audrey Bushy, and I'm president of Reflections on the River Board of Directors. And I guess our main um, concern is safety and security for our people and our development. Um, so I heard tonight some answers, um, but I just need some clarifications on stuff. Um, the building that's the closest to us, um, there is a road that separates our property uh, from apparently the beginning of this property. It's a service road that goes down. But from that, um, I'm hearing that there will be a 25 foot buffer and that the buffer will be approximately, let's see, let me just say, how tall? There'll be a buffer and there'll be plantings on top of the buffer. Yeah, this is a rendering of the, that, again, this is all the applicants doing but they did a better job than I did of, of the rendering okay can you can you point on the map to where she is talking about you said river runner or your uh, reflections, reflections okay. On the river. okay um I represent 203 
Here's uh, owners and reflections on the river that was built in the 80s. So reflections on the, this is the north portion of reflections on the river mm -hmm. and the service road that she's referencing, there's an, it, it's, it's different now, but it's, um, there's the service road here and that it's also paved in a portion and then it loops around the stormwater uh, for the ALF now. Yes. So that's a service road for who? Up re reflections. Understand. But anyways, from what I, what people are asking me is, so from the line, how far in is the first building? It the it's eighty five feet building to building. But you're right. So the building is the the it's thirty feet from the line. So you have service road, twenty five feet of buffer, an additional five foot separation, and that's the beginning of the building. That's on their property. The total it's separation. Not 85 feet. The total separation between the buildings is 85 feet. The buildings. Between the the northernmost unit existing in reflections and the proposed building is 85 feet of separation, building okay, to building. Feet, okay. And you know that's for safety and security. Um, that whole buffer that's there now, um, that's a lot of invasive plant, um, pepper trees and everything, is going to be completely removed. The invasives will be removed, correct. They will probably more than likely, I can't speak for them, but I'm sure Matt can answer. They'll probably try to reserve, preserve existing good material that you can preserve on the property. Correct. There's pr proposed to save some existing trees, native trees that are in the buffers that will stay there. Brazilian yeah. peppers. So that will be completely removed from the beginning of the property all the way down to the river? No, nowhere near all the way. It's several hundred feet of wetlands will be preserved. Okay. Um, because in the corner, which you don't have a picture of, um, down here and where is the land of reflections, there is a, um, like a triangle of property that's owned by a, a person who also owns the assisted living. Okay. So how far down does the, um, you know, will the, all the pepper trees and everything else be taken away? Down to the where it says upland preserve area. All the way, all the way to US one. The the they will have to. How far they, east she's going? West she's going. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. I, how far east? Um, yes, correct. To the upland preserve area. Then then the clearing stops. Right. Correct. So then the, the natural stuff would stay. Correct. So I would say, roughly, the east half of reflections. Those units, they're. They're not going to, there's nothing in, that's going to change for probably the east half, if that makes sense. Well, there is um, villas that are in the north part there. Correct. And there's um, uh, two developments of villas, and um, I guess that would conflict. You know, we want to make sure that that's uh, preserved their privacy there, too. Right. Um, and one of the issues that didn't really get discussed, but I saw that needs to be discussed, is lighting. Um, so that would be come up in further conversations or further approvals about the type of lighting that would be? R right, so uh, yes, um, the, so they do have uh, street light pole um, locations already shown on the plan, the, the actual details of, of the shielding and the type and how all that works will um, be further yeah, reviewed and approved by staff through a separate process and that, and that is called out in the staff report. I, I mean, I will say that Again, by the design, intentionally or unintentionally, the, the buildings themselves will shield most of the site lighting because the site lighting is for the, primarily for the parking lot and the driveway connection, which by and large is all blocked by the buildings. Now, of course, there'll be building lighting, you know, modest ambient building lighting. Light, yeah, ambient lighting from the building itself, but there's, not yeah. site, there's no site lighting on the, per, on the periphery of well, the buildings. I guess my concern is for the people that live in those villas, they wouldn't watch if they that one building that's the closest, um, they probably would be able to look into their courtyards. And I wouldn't want the, it's so lit that, you know, that, I mean, you know, if you kept it, that's coming down the road, then we can ask about that. Okay. We've um, had the same, some, the same of the conversations with the person who built the assisted living. And he was a, an extremely cooperative man and took into, you know, consideration that their property butted right up to us. and and things that he decided. So we hope that we have the same relationship with this developers um, that we would have. I will speak up again um, about the traffic. 
we're lucky at Reflections that we have a, a light, but the traffic pattern from Schumann to Route 1 to R is horrendous. And in previous times, the people in Reflections have submitted uh, you know, <coughs> issues that come up with, with the lights there and the turnarounds. Um, you know, the uh, happens to be, it should be the left lane or the right lane if you're going south or north. But um, this definitely will increase the traffic pattern on Route 1. So I would like you to take that into consideration since there is no light um, going to be allowed to, you know, this turn and the turnarounds um, that are on Route 1 at the present time. So um, those are my concerns. So uh, Audrey, I want to I, I want to understand your buffer concern. So right now, the buffer that exists is a Brazilian pepper buffer. Yes. Um, and it's about twenty five. Well, I don't know how tall it is. Much taller than me. Put it that way. And <laughs> but I'm just saying that um, you know I wanted to know exactly. Right. So when this if this development goes through, the development from. Um, uh, the uh, US-1 up until the wetlands is going to be a berm and plantings and existing uh, oak trees and that sort of thing. But from then on, which will cover your villas, it's still going to be a Brazilian pepper, bu uh, Brazilian pepper oh, yeah. buffer. Well, and are you, you happy with the Brazilian pepper buffer? <laughs> Right. That are closest to US, US 1 that will be affected by removing that portion of the buffer mm. that you presently have and then putting this up. And I just want them to take into consideration the type of plantings they put. Right. You know, right. Way, you know, that yeah. The land, that they're just yeah. The trees, uh, you know, that they're bushes and a combination. And yeah. they can, they basically, if they really want to go over and look at what the assisted living did, they. You know, co combined to give us a very nice buffer. Um, Do you remember what the buffer was at assisted living? Is it 25 foot, 15? Yeah. So on the, on the US one side is the, the typical US one buffer. Yep. Um, on the back side, there's actually a wall with yeah. plantings on both sides. There's a wall, and that's another thing: is the buffer is it going to be a wall, or is it, it just going to be plantings? Well, it would be a berm, which will have the effect of it'll be solid, a, a berm, and then plantings. And how high is the berm? According to the applicant, it's about five feet. Yeah. I mean, I, say, I guess we would prefer a wall, um, something like that we have between us and the other. Yeah. Well, uh, Audrey, you need to get Joe's telephone number <laughs> and put it in speed dial. <laughs> so you, you need to be talking. Yeah. Jo Joe's going to give it to you right now. <laughs> okay. But anyways, those are my considerations. I'll let yep. anyone else. Yep. Thank you. Ryan, will you turn their microphone on? Oh, yeah, that would help. <laughs> you broke it, Audrey. <laughs> you got one over here. You want me to go yeah. over the other one? Uh, yeah, that one's, that, yeah. yeah. The red, the red light means yep. it's, sorry about that. Sorry. And was, am I correct in remembering that it was a, um, a type B buffer with a berm and a wall on top of that? It's a wall and a fence, and but with with, but the five five of the six feet is going to be solid berm, and then it it's it's clearly going to be more than six. It's probably going to be closer to to eight. It's six plus five. the eleven feet three inches on the slide. Right. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. It's a five. Five foot three inch berm. Oh, sorry, <laughs> Can't help you with that. Six six foot fence, but also a, at the time of planting a three foot uh, hedge on both sorry, sides. Sorry, that's that's how I got to the eight at the time the three foot at the time. So of on that fence. southern border, there will be a fence all the way down the southern border uh, in the uplands. Correct. When Not you get to the wetlands, they'll stop. And as far as the pepper trees, I, I, I'm sorry, uh, name and address, please. Oh, Paul Spees, sixty two forty East Mirror Lake Drive, in Reflections. Um, did you say there's a fence in the berm, in the middle of the berm? Yes, correct. Okay. I wanted to make sure that I heard that correctly. And where you get to the pepper plants, uh, have that down as under environmental, you'll be removing any invasive plants. Is that correct? And then will you be replacing in uh, wetlands, if you replace a lot of pepper plants, will you be replacing it with native plantings 
in the uh, wetlands if you remove the pepper plants in the Australian pine, which there's both in there, at least last I checked. I think that comes down to it. Yeah. You won't be removing the pepper plants? Aren't they invasive? Aren't they? I, I thought the county, I thought the county was uh, pushing for people to remove the pepper plants as much as they can. Anyway, all right, let me, let me go back to this, okay? You, sometimes you can tell the future by looking at the past. And if you look at the property where they're at, I think this project approximately three years ago, maybe you'll remember this if you were involved three years ago, you took, uh, you, you had a machine come in and do clearings, you know, maybe 100 yards and maybe it was a little less. You did about five of them along US-1. Were any of you involved when you did that? And I'm, I'm assuming you did perk tests or whatever in the land. If you go there now and you look, everywhere they did stuff to prepare for this, the concrete is all broken now. Now, luckily, the county, I talked to the uh, director of the public works, Mr. I won't even try to pronounce his name. Rich, just call him Rich. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, he was very good and he went and repaired all the concrete that they, that they broke up. So, and again, I'm, I'm just saying, you can sometimes tell what the future is gonna bring by looking at the past. And number two, if you just take a ride by, and I know you're not supposed to go without reporting it, but you look, that is the trashiest part. And I'm not blaming you for the trash. You did not do it. Uh, also, it's overgrown into the sidewalk. Half the sidewalk is, is you can't walk down because of all the grass. If they're not taking care of their property now, what are they going to do when they build this project? I just like some assurances that they're going to take care of that. Um, and so, getting so to Ryan, who cleared the land? I, I wouldn't venture, I guess. I'm not, I'm not yeah. sure of any of that. So n no one here knows. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, David. For the record, David Offstein. I'm, I'm not the owner. I'm here on behalf of the owner. Um, two or three years ago, it's been a very difficult process with COVID, and staff has been uh, just overrun, and they're doing a great job. We were asked by code enforcement to go out and clean up the edges of the property because they thought that it was interfering with um, some of the power lines that were out there and they wanted us to cut it back. We cut it back. We did not know that anybody broke up any concrete. Nobody ever told us that they did. We hired a local guy up here who does a lot of work around. Uh, code enforcement went out. They were very happy with what we did. Um, of course, we plan to be good neighbors. Of course, we plan to maintain our property. Uh, we think this is a, a stellar development. And, you know, and Joe's our eyes and ears on the ground. So I'm sure if anybody has any questions, he's going to get right with us. <laughs> but with respect to the clearing, we didn't clear so much as we, we, we had to go in and do some soil tests. And we cut back some of the, the, the Brazilian pepper from, we worked with staff. Uh, to be able to go in, because uh, it's very strict. Uh, you can't just go in and clear things. Uh, but we only cleared exotics, and um, we didn't know that anything was broken at all. If we had, we would have we rectified whatever, we, whatever, whatever had been broken. Yep. Okay, uh, getting to the density. And trust me, I can think of a hundred other things that you could build there that I don't want. <laughs> uh, I'm not objectionable <laughs> to this being built there. Uh, I am concerned about the, uh, the trading of the wetlands that is not on the property. If you take the three acres of wetlands that are on the property and add that to the 58 units, it gives them 61 units, which still keeps you at six uh, units per acre, which is what it's called for. If you look at reflections and you look at River Run, I can't talk about River Run, but I know Reflections was built in the 80s and early 90s. I'm not sure the, that R6 was there at that time. That is something that has come along since, I think, the 1990s. So you can't compare Reflections and River Run to those, that, this building because, you know, they were done a lot long before it. Okay. Um, and again, I don't want them to fill in any of the wetlands. So if that's the other option, I'd rather take this option that they're, they're offering now because I don't want them to fill in any of the wetlands. Uh, environmentally, I sent Ryan a couple of pictures. Did you receive them? I did. Okay. Uh, they're pictures of a Florida panther that is, uh, I don't know if it's nesting in there or lives in there, but it certainly roams there. We have pictures of it in reflections of the Florida panther. I'm just asking to, that you be careful uh, 
to make sure you don't hurt the, the Florida panther as you're doing so, because I believe it's a protected species. Is it a Florida panther? I, I, I certainly can't confirm it. I saw some pictures. I'm blown away if it I, is. I, I agree. Uh, blown away if that's a Florida panther. Well, I, I have other people I can bring you. Next time, maybe I'll bring more people that have seen well, it. No, send me the pictures, would I, you? I will. <laughs> yeah. Send me the pictures. What, what I do want to clear. Panther's tail. Really yeah, it's a long tail. It's not a bobcat. We know we have plenty of bobcats. We I'll, know bobcats. I'll, I'll send it to you. I do send want me, uh, send me yeah. the picture. I want to clarify that that this is just the conceptual plan development. At the preliminary and at the LDP, there are more stringent uh, environmental re reviews that, that do occur. Okay. And I already mentioned the Australian pines and the Brazilian peppers that I'd like to see uh, see that. And you already talked about um, that building D, which is the one that is closest to reflections. Um, there's a 45-foot road, as they mentioned, from the closest building to the buffer area, to their property line. And then there'll be a 25-foot um, buffer. And then that building D, that doesn't look like there's maybe like, but five or ten foot between the buffer and the building. So it does get kind of close. But again, uh, I'm just pointing these things out. Uh, and traffic is, is probably the biggest. The maps don't show it, but on the other side of where the exit's going to be is Old Dixie Highway at the Sebastian Roadside Diner, if you're familiar with that. Uh, and if I'm not mistaken, hasn't Sebastian, uh, they annexed some land a couple of years ago, and they're doing a large residential development off of Old Dixie on the other side of the railroad tracks. But when it gets done, I, I've heard them talk that they're trying to get a rear exit onto Old Dixie which they have to get permission from the county to do that. And those cars from that large development will also be exiting onto uh, old, or US-1 right at that entrance. And it, the old Dixie doesn't quite line up uh, because there is the U-turn, and when they do the U-turns, you know, they put that extra piece of tar in and they put the stripes. It, it kind of is, is quirky there how it lines up. So I think in the future, that's the traffic engineering should be looked into as things go on. But again, it, it could be a lot worse, you know. Uh, so thank you. So is that an accurate statement about I, the, well, um, I, traffic I, flow? Let me try to clarify a couple things. Well, I, I'm certainly not up to speed or even privy to um, the city of Sebastian items. I believe the project he's talking about is Sub Spirit, Spirit of Sebastian. Sebastian. I, I know one rich Spurka is how you pronounce his last name is does control the old dixie right away and is adamant about not allowing that second driveway connection that could change but as of right now it's not likely uh and as far as the uh, um, median configuration um i'm not 100 percent on it, it is an open cut but it's um for to go onto old dixie there to go west okay yep. anyone else <laughs> it's probably for the Did you do that? Phil yeah. muted himself. <laughs> no, muted no run, river run. I'm the president of the association. I represent 181 Indian River County taxpayers. And they've asked me to come down here and speak with you people. I came last month. We had a discussion, but we didn't have a meeting. I did send a lot of my questions to Ryan. I assume he moved them along for the questions, the answers he couldn't get to the developer and the... Uh, the contractors. I don't know that for sure because I didn't get any feedback from them, but I did get some feedback from Ryan and his plans. The first thing I'd like to know is, is a copy of the WGI presentation was made tonight available for me? I, I think it's public record at this point. Yes. So yeah, absolutely. Yes, okay. most so definitely. I can get a copy of that. Thank you. Joe, if I, if I could, so I don't want to cut you off, but uh, you, yes, the list of questions that you emailed me, I think <clears throat> probably half to two-thirds of them have already been answered in one form or another. There is some stuff in terms of day-to-day -day operations, ownership, stuff like that. I, if, if you don't mind, um, Matt, are you, or, or David? I, I'll ask them as, as we go. Uh, I'll, okay. I'll, I'll gather them that way. I was going to have them answer them before you ask them, but, uh, okay. but you, you can do that as well. Fine. I don't, I don't, this, this is, 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 is that microphone on right there? No, it, just, it, just try no. turning it on and you can sit right there. There you go. Now That'll work. work. Look at that. But now I'm part of staff. <laughs> so is this the same list? Is this the same part list of, the of questions now. you asked last time, Mr. Braun? Is this the same list of questions you asked last time? It is, with some answers, and I won't ask those again. Okay. But there's some other additional questions that came up after we looked at the answers 
and uh, I'd just like to give some clarification. Okay. Um, so I'll get a copy of the presentation. That works fine. I guess one of the questions is where does the three um, stormwater ponds drain to? What is the overflow for the stormwater ponds? Excuse me? Okay. This one turn on? Yep. Yes, yes. you're on. The red light, you're good. Adam Schildmeyer, WGI. Uh, sorry, I wasn't in, in the initial. Um, in the initial introduction there. Um, yeah, the three stormwater ponds are discharging towards the wetlands. Uh, they're, they're oversized to provide for flood mitigation and everything and then discharging towards the wetlands after. It'll be ducted to the wetlands and it'll just be on the wetlands. And Correct. Maybe into the river someday. Okay. So uh, they percolate through to the wetlands or surface flow? Surface flow. Surface but flow. That's only an outfall, so we're all talking about a yeah. Yeah. Yep. 100 year flood. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, maybe exactly. Okay, that was a question I did not have before. Okay, uh, the zo current zoning restricts the buildings to four stories in height. Is that the? It it, 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 it it does. Plans to plan to have four story buildings? No, uh, it doesn't. Re it doesn't restrict the number of floors. It's purely oh, restrict thirty five feet. It does. It's strict. It's Strictly regulated to 35 feet. It's nearly impossible to fit four floors in 35 feet. <laughs> but it'll be three story buildings. Correct. And if there's four of them, that means there's eight units per eight, building. 18. Eight, eight units per floor. 36. Okay. Or, I'm sorry. That's 24. No, I'm sorry. Six, six, sorry. Six, sorry. Six, six units per floor. On, We're going to get this right. <laughs> What's the size of the average unit? It, can I was gonna can we I was trying to attempt if David could give an overview of sort of all of that it might oh I thought he okay no he, we haven't touched on any of the sort of of that stuff and Matt might be able to chime in that's I wasn't trying to cut you off Mr. Brown but he might be able to answer a lot of your questions if he could just give a quick um, those side plan questions sure sure I'm happy um, so the the units in size there's a one bedroom and a two bedroom units the two bedroom units are 1,194 square feet under air, 1,273 gross square feet. All the units have covered lanai's on the back. The one bedroom units are 909 square feet under air and 1,005 uh, gross square feet. We have a floor plan up on the, up on the screen. Thank you, Ryan, uh, for putting that up there. We also have conceptual elevations, which have been part, there you go, uh, part of uh, our project. Front of elevation being on the south side. The buildings are all the same, uh, 18 units per building. I have the questions that you had submitted. I was uh, waiting till we maybe heard some more questions uh, to fill them out, but I, I'm happy to go through them right now, and I'll try to skip okay. what has been presented. Great. And if I miss something, let me know. Okay. Um, we talked about the density increase. Uh, I talked about the traffic, the buffer zones. Um, I question, think. Question on the buffer zone. Sure. On 109th Street, there's the paving and there's some portion of the grass that belongs to that county road. Uh, 109th Street is not a county road, it's a private road. We don't have any right Where to access the property road. line for Sebastian Lindings relative to that. So uh, I, I, I don't offhand know the distance between the edge of pavement and our property line, but there is, the, there is a grass area between the edge of the southern edge of pavement and our property line. Our buffer won't be anywhere in that right of way, in that private road. Our buffer will begin at the southern end of the private road, and then it'll be 25 feet. It will include a 5.8 foot berm with a fence on top and hedges on either side of the fence trees. and trees, both sides. It's going to be a, a great berm, a great buffer between uh, the property. There will be no activity from our project on 109th. Okay. I just was curious how close the fence might be to 109th. It, it, it'll be set back uh, however long the rise of the berm is. I don't know exactly what that is. 
Okay. Okay. Um, uh, now, one, one point that I, I wanted to make um, is when we when we looked at what we could do on the site, we looked at the the, the current multifamily zoning. And we tried to really, and I think our, stat, our, our consultants did a fantastic job of um, the best that we could do to minimize the impacts to abutting properties, uh, to maximize what the comp plan suggests and incentivizes is development away from the lagoon, preserving the, the wetlands, which in this case also minimizes impacts to the property to the south. We've put our stormwater ponds, at, at least in the northeast portion of the, in the property, so that we could move the buildings as far away. And we have setbacks that are three to more than 10 times what the setbacks that would otherwise be required. Were we to have just developed, it would be a lower buffer requirement. Uh, the buildings, in theory, not that we would have done it, could have been much closer to the property line. So we really tried to do our best, and I think we did a great job of moving things away from US-1, moving things away from the east part of the property, and only putting the sides to the north. And in where we do have the one building that is um, east-west, that's on the south side of a private right-of-way behind a 25-foot buffer with a larger setback. So I just, I just wanted to point out that um, we think there's a major public benefit and that this really is the culmination of a, a decades-long public-private partnership with the CGW Bank, where they granted some TDRs for this purpose, to be able to preserve the, the one mile of wetlands along the, CGW, along the Indian River Lagoon, to uh, help developers to not fill the on-site wetlands. And because of those things, we're able to accomplish all of those things in this site plan. So I just wanted to touch on that. That was our goal, was to minimize to the extent that we can and provide a superior development to be good neighbors and to provide a quality development, um, you know, to be successful. And there's no plans for any condominiums or co-ops. This is all apartments. No, this is, this is a market rate rental property. Uh, we're going to try to get uh, as uh, the highest rates we can for it, uh, depending on the market. Will there be an on-site <laughs> office? Oh. Yeah, we, we have a cabana that has a room for an office. Our plan at the moment is to have uh, on-site management for the property. It's because obviously my taxpayers would like to see 72 taxpayers next door, okay, instead of one. Uh, one very large taxpayer. Uh, they'd like to see 72, <laughs> well, okay? Well. But that's just, oh, by the way, mm -hmm. now, as long as it's well managed, we're okay. The, 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 the good news, I guess it would, I would say it's the good news, is with one owner to the south, that's one entity that gets a phone call from the county that gets a visit, God forbid, from code enforcement. There's, they, pick it up, they pick up the phone, they call them. Uh, we've got our on-site guy uh, in, in Indian River right now. Get that beach. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think that there will be adequate... Um, uh, safeguards and security for both abutting properties to ensure, and it is in our interest to ensure, that it is kept at the, the best uh, quality that it can possibly be. We want it to be a show place. Because our facility, the facilities mm -hmm. to the north of us, Floor of Shores, mm -hmm. the neighbors that we have on 109th Street, mm -hmm. and as far as I know, Reflections, has had very little problems with noise or any of those other kind of neighborhood problems. And we're trying to make sure that at least there's some control over that. From our perspective, we, we want to have that major issue. We want to have that in our community, Mr. Brown. Let's stick to your questions and try to stay away from diverting from your questions. Fine. Okay. Number six was the type of residential units we just talked about. That um, seven on the list that I had were the conceptual drawings. They were submitted and are in our presentation and are available for you to you. take and look. Like Include as Ryan or do I get them from you? Uh, you, well, you, from you, Ryan. Can, you can get them from Ryan. Mr. Braun, yeah. if you have any other questions, go ahead and address them to the board. Let's see if we can move, move, move this along a little bit. Okay. Uh, occupancy is Mr. Braun, to the, to the board. Make your comments to the board, please, sir. Question Thank you. Is there, a, is there a senior age associated with this? Is no. No. No children or how did it work? And I guess it's an apartment house, so it's whoever, whoever applies. I, I don't know. The question was... There, there is no... If it's the board's pleasure, I do have 
five more questions that were submitted at the last time I have answers to. I, I'm happy to read through them and maybe some of the back and forth will get answered. I can only hope. Okay. Um, there was a question about the berm, was question number nine. We've discussed the berm. Um, and I think the request was, is there going to be a berm? Is there going to be a fence? And the answer to both of those is yes. Um, is there site lighting being planned? Yes. For safety and security, there is site lighting being planned. It will be done in accordance with the county's code and reviewed at, at, in great detail to ensure no, um, um, whatever the county's code requires as far as no overspill and things like that, it'll be reviewed very closely. Um, the air conditioning units, which was a question of what consideration is given so that the equipment doesn't make, the mechanical equipment doesn't make noise. It's all ground mounted equipment. It'll all be buffered by itself, which will also be buffered by the buffers around the property. Okay. okay. Um, we talked about site management. Uh, and the last one was there will be a community hotline. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll have a number on a sign um, for if there's some other issue. Uh, and Mr. Palin will be here. Uh, if anybody has any problems during construction, they can call us and we'll jump on it immediately. Those were all the questions um, I think that were submitted. If there's any other ones and the board has, I'm happy to answer anything that I can. If I can have a copy of your presentation and the WGI, I think it satisfies my ability to report back what I've heard. I don't want to misquote you. <laughs> well, I'd rather have an electronic copy if I could, because it's great. I could, I'll, Mr. Brown, I'll email it to you, not tomorrow, because I'm luckily off for what seems like a long time. Um, uh, but I'll, I'll send it to you uh, next week. OK. You know, the objective is to communicate back to the 130. Understood. Very good, sir. Thank you. <coughs> hey, you. Anyone else? Yeah, I, I've worked for 11 years with this staff, and it is the best. Yeah, it, it is. And yep. I go to MPO meetings, and they're great, too, when I go yep. to the MPO meetings. <laughs> oh, uh, and yep. let me just say this. Can I say something to the developer? See, up, up at the microphone. Yeah, if you could step back up. Up at the microphone. Uh, I, I don't need a microphone. Exercise. <laughs> well, the recording does. Oh, oh, okay. uh, find a hot mic. Yeah. Yeah. And we work we'll very closely with the developer of the ALF uh, as it was being built. Very, very enjoyable project for them. He was more than well, willing to work with us. And I can't think of one thing that we wanted that he didn't accommodate us. If you would just work with us, we'd rather be good neighbors than enemies. So if you would contact us and we'll work with you as the project goes on. This is a team effort. Exactly right. Thank you. Thank you. We, Thank you. And we will be watching out too for these comments as well. <clears throat> making sure uh, from a staff perspective that they get addressed and I uh, want to thank him for the kind words. Thanks, Dad. No, we're not related. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Close the public hearing. Any questions or a call for a motion? I, I do just have one last question. Um, Ryan, my whole perspective on this comes down to compatibility with the surrounding areas, which is why I asked that question about density in the two developments, north and south. Um, and I'm satisfied that the compatibility of this project with the surrounding areas works pretty well. The only place it, it I'm a little bit concerned is the gentleman who spoke who lives in that house right in the corner. <laughs> now he's building to building, as I understand it, it's 76 feet, which 25 yards. As a golfer, and I know Curtis is a golfer, that's a little chip shot. I mean, it's right over there. <laughs> I'm putting from 25 yards. <laughs> there you go. Um, go off the green. And I was wondering, are there, and, and under the, the special exception process, one of the safeguards that is frequently used to, net, to minimize impacts on surrounding properties is buffers. We've had a lot of discussion about buffers. My only question really is, um, in your opinion, are, are there any additional buffer characteristics that could be added to help protect or help minimize the impact of this project on that gentleman in the corner? The, the, the one item that we do see on occasion is a, a step down where the central mass is three stories and then like say the last two units is only at two stories. It's not a huge benefit, but the, the thing that I will add and I don't, I don't think it comes across as much 
um, but this is the end of the building. There's there's no lanai's, there's no front door, there's no back door. This is the end of the building. There's probably windows, but that's it. And it's not broadside. Broadside is a complete, either mm -hmm. the entire front or the entire rear of, of the building would be would be considerably different. And, and Ryan and Alan, I, I, I would, I would I, I'm very confident that if during the landscaping, which is coming up, and, and we're, we're, we're talking about buffers tonight, but as far as the landscaping, I'm sure they would install canopy trees, taller palms, something like that to alleviate this problem. I, I'm very confident in, in something like that. And I was curious to, to the gentleman, I'd asked the question, I probably should have asked it earlier, but that closest point to your house, um, that 76 feet, is that your garage? Okay. Do you have Joe's number? Not yet. <laughs> Get it. <laughs> Get it. I do now. Yep. Mm -hmm. You done, Alan? Yeah, I, I mean, just as a comment, I might look differently on this project if north and south projects were at the six units per acre or less. Um, but 8.5, 7.5, 7.43, I don't see a significant difference. Yep. Do we know if the zoning changed? Uh, yeah, I, I, can, I don't know the history of the zoning to the north and south. I can tell you that uh, River Run to the north, which was, I actually was able to track down, I'm sorry, I don't know if it was River Run or Reflections. <laughs> I've got some really old 80s uh, uh, maps here, old, old in, I guess, relative terms, but I'm sorry, this is Reflections. Um, but yeah, the, the zoning and land use changed uh, Quite a lot in the, in the 90s when the when the Florida Growth Management Act went into effect and the comp plan was ultimately beefed up and adopted. So I think it had to have been somewhere around eight. The zoning was more like RM8 or even 10. Um, the 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 buildings on River Run are actually four stories. I don't know if they meet the 35 foot requirement or not. They it's really close. <laughs> but that was under yes. They, those items did change. Thank you. We done? I have. I, I just have one quick comment, and I'll be done. Um, I, my my heart does go out to the River Run guys and the Reflections guys, and especially the guy that lives on the the the, the street there. Um, but this could be a whole lot worse. It could be a whole lot worse. I mean, those wetlands could be gone. You could have more buildings there. You'd have about the same density. And I just want you guys to understand that. Again, I feel bad. I mean, I wouldn't want anybody putting up a place next to my where I live either. But this really isn't terrible. It could be a lot worse. And I just want everybody to really understand that. That's all. Good point, Curtis. I've called for a motion. Chair, I'd move to approve. With staff's recommendations. Staff's recommendations. We have a motion to approve by Beth. I'll second it. We have a second by Jordan. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Uh, Commissioner Matters. Thank you all. Do these yeah. I want to say something else. Uh, okay, let me just one real point of order for everyone that's still in the audience and the applicant and the PNZ. Um, this does ultimately still need to go to the Board of County Commissioners and there will be another round of mailings and sign postings and all of those things we're aiming for sometime in early December, depending on how the ad deadlines work. So just keep your eye out on for your mailbox and sign postings. And we thank you all for your cooperation, your attention, and your comments. Thank you for your update. And so you guys have another shot at this sometime in December. Keep an eye on your mail. Uh, planning, planning matters. Yeah, let me announce to you real quick. Yes. Sorry. You're going to get Go noticed ahead. by mail, and if you're also if you're in the email group, you'll get the I'll forward the email as well. Okay. We got it. Thank you. Um, the only available date for the P and Z normally. Um, it's going to be the third Thursday of the month. The second Thursday is Veterans Day, fourth Thursday is Thanksgiving. We're not sure we're going to have a meeting. It depends on what's on the agenda. So if you could keep the date clear, we would, we would greatly appreciate that. Um, I have a second matter. Uh, what I'm trying to do personally is get um, alternates for every single committee and board that we have, as you know. It's, it's kind of a shame if we have to not have a meeting because of a lack of a quorum. One of your very own, uh, Curtis, is a wonderful member of our Affordable Housing Advisory Committee. Uh, they do very good work to try to make sure that affordable market rate and workforce housing is provided in the county. 
It's another one of our responsibilities at PNZ. And um, while Curtis is, is wonderfully public spirited and generous hearted, I know he's on a lot of committees, I see his name on everything. Uh, we don't meet that frequently and for times that he might not be available, I'd love to get an alternate from this board to the Affordable Housing Advisory Committee. And I see a hand go up, okay. wonderful. Great, so thank, thank you Curtis and thank you very much Beth for, uh, it probably won't happen too often. Mm -hmm. And at the risk of making a long meeting even longer, I've got one question. Uh, a year ago, uh, I think we talked about a workshop, a water workshop. I think that we talked about that on, on, in this meeting uh, with you. And, and my, my thought is that if we were in this situation that California is in right now, we would be in a terrible mess. And I think your idea about a water workshop is timely and it would be really good to do it before we hit the big drought so absolutely I, yeah, I'd well, like to just say that I, I thought it was a good idea a year ago and I still do yeah uh, we'll, we'll work on it good good attorney matters none sir thank God this meeting is adjourned good job, Dr. I'm too old longest one in a while